Support for the podcast series Forgotten Prison comes from Gonzaga Law School and its Center for Civil and Human Rights, dedicated to enriching the educational experience of students and contributing to the practice of civil and human rights. Details at gonzaga.edu slash law. Thanks to Humanities Washington for their generous grant. It was a dark and stormy night. The wind and the wait, rain. Wait, 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 Simone. What? You can't start the story that way. Well, why not? It's, don't you think it's a little cliche? Maybe, but, you know, cliches are cliche for a reason. And it really happened that way. It really was one of those big okay. northwest winter windstorms. <laughs> okay, okay, well, continue. Okay. So, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> The wind and the rain whipped my face as I walked alone in the dark. I started up a narrow set of stairs outside an old Seattle home. I was here to see a man about Charles Manson. Yes, that Charles Manson. In case you haven't heard of him, he was a notorious cult leader who had such power over his mostly young women followers that they were willing to kill for him. In the summer of 1969, the Manson family went on murder sprees, setting Los Angeles and the country on edge. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. Tate and the other victims had been shot and repeatedly stabbed. The word pig was found written in blood on the walls. Supposedly, Manson saw the murders as a way to somehow spark a race war that could lead to the apocalypse. Manson and several followers were convicted of murder and conspiracy and sentenced to life in prison. Charles Manson was still locked up in California when he died in 2017 at age 83. The man I went to see on that dark and stormy night met Charles Manson before all of that. Leonard Shaw crossed paths with the soon-to-be cult leader in the early 60s, while Manson was doing time in Washington State at the federal prison on McNeil Island. Charlie was in the office one day, sitting there, and he and I just struck up a conversation. Leonard is a psychotherapist who has done a lot of work in prisons. Back then, he was still getting his graduate degree at the University of Washington. Between 1962 and 1963, he did some field work at the McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. And he was an interesting person. He was obviously pretty bright. And so I said, well, why don't I ask Putman to put you on my Uh, counseling list so we can talk every week. Putman is Lawrence Putman, who was the warden of McNeil at the time. Leonard and Charlie, as Manson was known then, talked for about an hour a week during Leonard's few months at the prison. Back then, prison officials and other inmates mostly saw Charlie Manson as just some punk. He was 28 years old then, and he'd already been in and out of correctional institutions most of his life for stealing cars and pimping out girls. He ended up at McNeil through a combination of prostitution and check forgery. Did you see him as irredeemable when you were working with him? That's an interesting question. I never thought about him that way. But when I look back on it, I'm not sure if I had any kind of a constructive impact on him at all. From KNKX in the Washington State History Museum, this is Forgotten Prison. I'm Paula Whistle. And I'm Simona Alicea. The prison on McNeil Island in South Puget Sound ran for 136 years as a territorial, a federal, and a state institution. That's 136 years worth of stories that can help us understand how prison and the purpose of it have changed over time. So take Charles Manson and his incarceration. 
From McNeil, he was transferred to a minimum security prison in California, and he was paroled from there in 1967. He became drawn to the summer of love crowds in San Francisco, where he began to build his following. That, of course, eventually culminated in those murder sprees around Los Angeles two years later, which almost immediately became a symbol of the darkest aspects of humanity. One officer summed up the murders when he said, in all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. In his biography of Manson, author Jeff Gwynn writes about lessons young Charlie learned while he was on McNeil Island. He was drawn to Scientology, seeing it as one way he might manipulate women into prostituting for him once he got out. It was also on McNeil that he polished his guitar skills. One guard said he was a real hit at the talent shows. And he listened to the Beatles on the radio in his cell. He later used music to attract followers and build his philosophies about racial war, which he referred to as Helter Skelter. The thing is, prison officials at the time saw Charlie's interests as good things. Inmates finding faith has long been considered rehabilitative, but for most of history, that was limited to Christianity. In the 60s, that thinking was starting to expand to other religions. Art and literature programs also picked up around this time, and prison officials wrote that Charlie's musical ambitions helped him stay out of trouble in the last years he was on McNeil Island. So what happened? How is it that Manson went from petty criminal to someone who was able to command others to murder for him, who was at one point called the most dangerous man alive? A lot has been written about Manson and this question, but Leonard, the psychotherapist who met with Charlie at McNeil as a graduate student, provides a little bit of insight as to what role the prison played. He says people were skeptical when he first offered to counsel Charlie. Charlie knew everybody considered him a waste of time. When you say waste of time, what do you mean by that? Well, he was such an institutionalized inmate, and he'd been in and out of prisons ever since he was 13 years old or something, you know. So um, he was considered a hopeless case. I think people have asked this question, which was, you know, why weren't all of these institutions able to stop a man like that from getting that power and from doing that? I don't know if, if somebody took a personal interest in Charlie when he was a juvenile, if they could have sent him in another direction. I'm, I'm open to that possibility, but by the time I met him, characterologically, he was so fixed. Um, I mean, I had no idea he was going to pull something like he did, but I certainly felt he, uh, it fit with his personality type. The story of Charles Manson and his time on McNeil Island gets to our root questions about crime and punishment. If Manson was born a criminal, then what could the prisons have done to change him? If he was a product of his environment, what role did the prisons play in shaping who he became? In some ways, these questions are timeless. But when you start looking into a place with as long a history as McNeil Island, you start to realize it's not just our answers that have changed over time, but also which questions we ask. Simone, what are you doing? I am sitting at my desk and I am trying to look up uh, some of the crimes that folks were in for in the way, way early days. Wow, that's at just McNeil what, Island. 1887 to 1939? What's this from? So this is from the, we got this from the National Archives and they, they have a list of um, all of the folks who were at McNeil Island while it was a federal prison. Uh, so let's see, what do we got here? Wow, C.C. Could... Huff mm -hmm. from New York, uh, in for selling liquor to Indians. 
Charles Parker of Massachusetts. So this is 1886-87, selling liquor oh to God. Indians. William Whalen from New York from 1887, selling liquor, liquor to, to Indians. Indians. Liquor, liquor to, to Indians. Oh, wow, look liquor at that. Liquor to Indians. That's what everybody was in for then. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, oh. Definitely, definitely in the early days. Often the crimes on the books reflect the attitudes and racism of the times. Looking at McNeil's list of inmates, you see moments when changes in the criminal code had a huge impact on who ended up there. Another time when you see things change in a big way is in the 1920s and 30s, when the FBI was targeting mobsters and gangsters. Gwen Whiting is the curator of the Washington State History Museum exhibit about McNeil. We've been working with her on this project. So you have narcotics acts being passed. You have, of course, prohibition comes along later. Um, You have further restrictions on uh, post crimes against the post office. And so the population of McNeil starts doubles um, very, very quickly. This happens in the modern era, too. When you read about prison overcrowding, sometimes it's because laws have changed. In the 1980s, when the state took over McNeil, it was because there weren't enough beds at other Washington prisons. It was a time when there was an increased concern about gangs and violence. All of it dominated the local news. Live from Seattle. Arrested for the possession and sale of cocaine. Threats of violence. And in Tacoma, another murder on the hill. A woman is gunned down. Como News 4 is dedicating a whole month to looking at crime in our community. Crime crackdown, only on Como. In the 80s and 90s, the Washington legislature passed laws that increased prison sentences and did away with parole. Meanwhile, voters in the state passed the nation's first three strikes law and something called hard time for armed crime. You could say we're starting to see a swing in the other direction. The best example might be changes around marijuana. Washington state was among the first to legalize it several years ago, and now the governor is set to pardon thousands of people with misdemeanor pot convictions. So who we've locked up has changed, but how we lock them up has also evolved. And McNeil can tell us about that as well. Here. McNeil was one of the first federal prisons in the country. It opened in 1875. That's 60 years before Alcatraz. It later became a state prison and closed for good in 2011. We got an open door here. A walk through the abandoned buildings tells us a lot about how the structures and programs evolved over the last century. Holy Moses. Remember, this is prison in 1907. Our guide is Eric Heinitz with the State Department of Corrections, which still oversees parts of the island. This place is completely off limits to the public. We're here as part of this project with the Washington State History Museum, and we had to go through a background check and take a government foot ferry to get here. Can you describe the space to end? What are we seeing right now? Oh, you're seeing three tiers of the typical stuff you see in movies of cell blocks. So you got the concrete wall with the um, bar doors that slide open, a little entrance into each door where they can put their food in and out of three tiers. And the two upper tiers have got um, chain link fence covering them so that you can't throw people over the side. Believe it or not, this old cell block actually housed inmates into the 90s. Later, the state of Washington determined they were inhumane and closed them. So no, the windows are uh, painted over. Was, would that have been true at the time? Um, yes, I believe so. Oh, wow. So it's they, in here. Yeah. It was not a place that you'd want to go. I mean, but back when these cell houses were constructed, they were seen as an improvement in how we treat prisoners. Before McNeil was built, many early American prisons designed by Quakers kept people in isolation behind high walls with hoods over their heads. The idea was that it would force them to reflect on their crime and repent. Reflecting on your actions may seem like a nice idea, but it turns out long-term isolation can mentally break a person. By the time this cell house was built in the 1900s, a new way of running prisons had taken hold. It still encouraged religious reflection, but now inmates could interact with each other. The barred doors meant they could see out and eventually talk.
Wandering around the abandoned prison is like taking a tour through prison history. Besides the living quarters, you also have the common spaces. You can see all the architectural detail here. You get an idea of how high the ceilings are just from the echoes. A lot of them were built in the 1920s and 30s, and they have a grand feeling to them with arched windows and columns. But as we explored, we found the place to be a bit of a maze. I could have sworn we came through here. I'm all turned around. Prisons are like that. I, I found that in the other two prisons I visited too, like I found it really hard to keep track of what was where. Maybe that's by design, huh? Could be. That looks nasty on the floor. Oh, I think maybe this is where we went through. Oh, okay. If we go Are we going to be able to find our way back? Yes. Okay. We are not going to get lost in here. Yes, see there's okay. a mural. Oh, oh Sorry. the mural, the mural. This mural in one of the dining halls was painted by an inmate in the 1950s. It depicts a bucolic mountain scene with a river and trees. It might have been a calming thing to see while you were eating here. In the early days before the mural was painted, prisoners had to eat in complete silence. But starting in the 20s, at least there was music. An inmate band would play on stage during meals. It was one of the reforms instituted by Warden Finch Archer. History Museum curator Gwen Whiting says Archer also provided better education for inmates and added thousands of books to the prison library. He also allowed inmates to decorate their own rooms and to pick their own cellmates, which is extremely unusual. Um, this was around the same time that um, ideas in prison reform were changing um, overall over the entire country. And so McNeil and other federal prisons were undergoing a lot of scrutiny. So they were looking a little more closely at, you know, outward appearance and how that impacted um, both prisoners and, frankly, press coverage <laughs> of the prisons. Yeah. Oh, it's open. Oh, okay. This is one of the cell houses the state built, the more modern dormitory style. As we continue our tour through time, we head into a cell house built in the 1990s. Very little construction was done at McNeil in the mid-20th century. This place is different than the old cell house. The architecture is less Shawshank Redemption and more orange is the new black. Gwen says the new construction at McNeil shows another shift in our approach to prison. At that point, they go from being called cells technically, although we've been referring to them such here, um, to being called rooms. And so the concept starts to be more that it's, it's more of a dormitory style way of living. These cell houses were considered safer for staff. Because of the design, you could monitor a whole group at once and see all of their doors. This looks even smaller. Hmm. Smaller than the ones over there. Yeah. It's longer, but not as wide. But you have a window, which makes it feel long. The window is teeny tiny. Yeah, but in the 1907 ones, you don't see anything. Yeah, I was You can get a little teeny bit of light. And you have a view, Simone. You have a view here. I still don't think it's all that great, is all I'm saying. No, it's not so great, it's, but it's better than the 1907 cell house. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I mean, you're still in prison. There's something about it that seems patronizing. In what way? It's like... I don't know. You're pretending that it's like a dorm, but it's not. But it's not. Right. That's exactly what it is. Those silos that... That's the old honor farm. Old honor. So none of that is, by there afterwards. has been in use. The old honor farm is a few miles inland from the abandoned prison. It started in the 1920s. Eric Heinitz with the Department of Corrections says during the federal era, minimum security inmates would work here. They used to have a piggery that was up over there where they used to manage pigs and for pork. They'd learn farming skills and be ready to get a job when they got out. 
Other federal prisons also set up farms. The Honor Farm on McNeil Island shut down when Washington State took over the prison in the 1980s, and farms were eventually phased out at other federal prisons too. On McNeil, the focus shifted to things like teaching boat building and repair. So this is the old marine shop that used to build um, all the wood boats and stuff. Sorry, the point is, here, ideas but... are always changing when it comes to how to keep criminals from reoffending. Prison trends come and go. Things are seen as being too soft on inmates or too harsh or just ineffective. One old program shows how difficult it can be to find a balance. Mike Michener worked as a corrections officer on McNeil Island for 10 years. In the mid-1990s, he got excited about an experimental program that was being tried on McNeil Island called the Work Ethic Camp. And the whole idea was, if you have a work ethic, maybe you won't commit crime when you get out. That was the idea. Mike was interviewed last year by Dave Beals, who is with the State History Museum at the time. The work ethic camp was part of a national trend towards so-called boot camps for prisoners. In Washington, inmates who did the program had their sentences reduced. The program was designed for people with low-level, first-time felony convictions. People like Corey Walster. And I was really happy because I was sentenced to 27 months. And going by going there, it meant that I would be out in four months. He arrived at the camp in 1999 after being busted in a sting operation for selling a fourth of a gram of meth. The first month was the toughest. Mike, who eventually became the supervisor of the camp, says that was by design, part of teaching self-discipline. You know, they had to do physical training in the morning, had to get up early, go to the PT, and they had to work all day. We would assign a team to go um, clear Scotch Brown. And that's what they did all day long. If you, don't, if you fail in the program, you're going to do your sentence. The first week I was there, every time I took a step, my knees would buckle. You know, it's, it's boot camp. It's military style. Um, you have drill sergeants um, yelling at you. At first, Corey wasn't sure he'd make it. <laughs> um, um, but you could, can't quit, right? Corey did make it through that first month. Mike explains that's when you start getting more responsibility. And the island, as you probably guessed, is, was maintained by offenders. Yeah. So the work ethic camp folks would would graduate to one of those work crews and work the, well, the last couple of months that were there, you know, picking up a skill. So my job, I made 28 cents an hour, um, mowing lawns, and um, but then also the classes were really great. I got my GED there. I also I was uh, I'm I'm a tribal member, so um, at night we got to go out on our own and and smudge and and pray and um, without any guards around us. Uh, that was, that was nice. So you might be thinking, well, there's a great example of an alternative to locking people up that seems to work. Here's this guy after his four-month stint ready to get a job and move on with his life. But that's not what happened. Corey finished the work ethic camp and returned to his home near Bremerton, but he couldn't find work. He got depressed, and things just kind of fell apart. The bad thing was there was very there was basically no follow up. I went from that incredibly strict setting to to no, basically nothing, and uh, I ended up really just kind of floundering for a long time until a friend called me up, want to hang out, <laughs> and uh, and the next thing I knew I was I was addicted to methamphetamine again. Corey got busted for selling again. This time, he was sent to Clallam Bay Prison on the Olympic Peninsula, and he had to serve his whole sentence. He did eventually get out, and he's doing well. He's sober, has a job, is raising his daughter, but he's skeptical that prison or the work ethic camp had very much to do with that. In the end, the research was inconclusive on whether work ethic camp style programs prevented people from reoffending, and the program on McNeil Island ended. Mike says in Washington, one factor was that judges were beginning to give people convicted of low-level drug offenses the option of going into treatment programs. And so the, the, the program just kind of, it just kind of faded away.
what happened to the work ethic camp is true of a lot of prison programs. Often what seems like a good idea on paper maybe isn't, or maybe lawmakers just decide it's too expensive. I think it's partly because we're never quite sure if the purpose of prison is to just make people feel bad about what they did or make an effort to guide them toward something better. There are so many things that go into designing prisons, from the buildings themselves to the programs and policies, but the variable that designers can't totally control for makes up a huge part of what prison is, the people. Brian Funk was one of those people who was locked up on McNeil Island, and he says it was preferred to other state prisons. The atmosphere was better. People did appreciate actually being there. They didn't want to leave there. Brian shot and injured two people during a fight at a bowling alley in 1995. He served 19 years in Washington state and was released almost five years ago. He was on McNeil Island from 1997 to 2003. There are a few reasons Brian thinks McNeil was one of the better prisons in Washington. The views of Puget Sound and Mount Rainier helped, but he also says inmates at McNeil were less intense. That could be because it was always a medium and minimum security prison. But it was still prison, and you had to be ever vigilant. Prison is a complex social system. You have to know who you can trust, and information is valuable. Um, there wasn't things that went on without us discussing it. Um, we would typically know where a guy came from. Did he even come from D unit and just get moved to B unit? And why was that? Did he tell on somebody to get moved? Is he hot right now? Which means um, the guards are watching him and, his, you know, drugs, whatever it is. It's interesting. One, one person we talked to um, described prison as high school with knives, but maybe the um, addition to that is like high school with knives for like a decade. <laughs> No, it's exactly like high school, like I remember it. Everybody was treated kind of the same way that they would be in prison, you know, um, judged. And, or, you know, it was those cliques. Um, when I got to Kuala Bay, there was Muslim tables. Um, you know, there was white boy tables. And there was, you know, um, Nazis, basically, whatever. I, I was in a lot of fights in high school, actually, I should say. So that was not unlike prison was. And it was based off of stupid pride and respect and just talking crap and it it wasn't any less juvenile than prison is yeah it was high school with knives and for decades but inmates don't just have to navigate their relationships to each other when you think about it guards are also spending most of their time in prison eight hours a day or more that adds another level of human X factor that can affect how prison works. Many of the former correctional officers from McNeil that we spoke to agree with much of what Brian says. That includes Darren Filer, who worked on the island in the 90s and early 2000s. I, I look back as, at McNeil Island was relatively laid back. Um, with when I, when I say laid back, uh, I mean by the amount of offender disturbances. Um, there wasn't a ton of fights, you know. Um, there were fights, they, were, they weren't uncommon. Darren now trains other officers. He was also interviewed by Dave Beals, who did a lot of early research on this project for the museum. When you listen to the interview, you realize prison guards had their own social system to figure out. In some ways, it was like any workplace. Sometimes it's just boring, like when you're on tower duty. It was monotonous, it, it is tough. Um, your focus is the fence yeah. you know, and, and or any inmates that are in the area. So um, it is monotonous. Um, and that, honestly, I liked it because um, you didn't have the inmates in your face. The inmates make this different from other workplaces. It's not just that guards are managing people. They have a lot of power and responsibility. It's their job to carry out our vision of prison. And sometimes, yeah, it can be dangerous. On McNeil Island, in addition to tower duty, Darren also worked in the isolation unit. 
Most prisons have this. It's where inmates are isolated temporarily, often as punishment for breaking rules. He says there it was especially important to follow procedure. If you didn't use your handcuffs correctly, if you didn't put them on right and an inmate was able to slip, or you open up the cuff port, the little door to place them in handcuffs, did they have a weapon, you know, to stab, attempt to stab you? Um, some inmates would get pretty nasty and they would throw what we called a milkshake on people. They would urinate and uh, put feces in a cup, shake it up and throw it on staff. He says sometimes you'd have to get your riot shield and go in. Um, you knock the inmate, you take him to the ground, you hold, pin him to the ground, get their hands and their legs and you restrain him and you put him in a cell until they calm down. The guards and inmates we talk to say the bad stuff you see in movies does happen. Inmates fight each other, sometimes they attack guards, and sometimes guards abuse inmates. Drugs get smuggled in. But we also just heard a lot about ordinary life. Officers in the tower chit-chatting with their colleagues or inmates scheduling their day around school or sports or work. And all these day-to-day -day things also contribute to whether prison works. Take Brian, he's the one who compared prison to high school. After he got out, he became a wastewater treatment plant manager in Snohomish County. He's the kind of success story that prison officials will point to, to say prison is a place where people can turn their lives around. But as you talk to Brian, you'll hear the official programs and policies were all kind of secondary to his relationships. I almost sound like I miss prison sometimes when I talk to people about it, and it's kind of sad because... Well, I, you spent so much of your life there, your adult life, pretty much. Yeah, I grew up, yeah, 19 years, and I went in when I was 18, so it's more intimate than even some people have with their own families because, you know, you're living in an 8 by 10 cell with another man. Um, you're living in a, uh, you know, fenced few acres, right? I mean, you know, 19 years with friends and people that I consider some of the best people I've ever met in my life. I've heard even guards to go back to guards and stuff. There was guards that sat there and talked to me and listened to my story. Um, they cared about my family. Um, they would walk my family into trailer visits when I, my family would come. They would ask me questions about, you know, what are you going to do for a job when you get out, you know? Um, uh, that kind of stuff makes a difference? Oh, yeah. So I'm curious then, do you see your experience in prison as having been a net positive for your life or a, or a net negative? There's no way I would be the man and the person I am today. Um, I take pride in knowing that um, I'm four years out of prison. Um, I'm making almost $100,000 a year. But um, I would have liked to not done 19 years in prison to learn these lessons, and I feel like maybe 10 years would have been fine, and that's, that's the truth. But I believe in God, and I believe that it took 19 years for me to be at this point where I'm at today. People working. This is the old auditorium. Well, the, uh, the dining hall, one of the dining halls. Oh, yeah. Standing in the empty prison, you try to imagine what it was like when it was full of people, like Brian and Darren, Corey and Mike. Hello? Hello? But even when there were people here, prison can still be a lonely place. And part of that's by design. You're being kept away from the rest of society. And the relationships you can build in prison aren't always positive. When it comes to prison, people get out. And that's the big question about designing prisons. How do we prepare for that? Both the inmates who do their time and those of us watching at a distance. That's why things change so much. We're always trying to figure that out.
McNeil can tell us a lot about prisons in general, but it's also unique because the prison was on an island. That made life a little different for inmates, guards, and their families. We explore the island life on Episode 4 of Forgotten Prison. Forgotten Prison is produced by me, Simona Alicea, and me, Paula Whistle. Our editor is Aaron Hennessy. Additional editing from Bethany Denton, who's also our mix engineer. Bill Anschel does our music, and Parker Miles Blome is the man behind our website, ForgottenPrison.org. That's also where you can find his amazing photos of the place. Kari Plogue is our digital content manager. Matt Martinez is our director of content. Our logo was created by Adrian Flores. Thanks so much to our partners at the Washington State History Museum, especially audience engagement director Mary Michael Stump and lead curator Gwen Whiting. Be sure to check out the accompanying exhibit about McNeil Island at the museum in Tacoma. That exhibit runs through May 2019. More details at ForgottenPrison.org. We also get some financial support from Humanities Washington. Special thanks to all of McNeil's former inmates and guards who shared their stories with us, especially Paul Wright, who gave us the phrase, high school with knives. Special thanks to the NPR Story Lab and training teams. And we also want to thank all our colleagues at KNKX for their support. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review of the podcast and please reach out. You can find our information at knkx.org. That website is also where you'll find all the news and music we have to offer at KNKX. And it's where you can make a pledge to support the in-depth journalism that you hear in this podcast. Thanks for listening. This is Forgotten Prisons.